good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. I am back with my first big video on the brand new PC. And in today's video, I shall be talking about Crystalline Conflict, covering the basics and a few tips that I use, all of which a player needs to know in order to begin climbing through the ranks. My name's Salamander, enjoy the video, and without further ado, let's get into it. My first tip for climbing the ranks of Crystalline Conflict is to not play one-off matches. Instead, play several. Now hold on, I have a good reason for this. If you sign up for a new match following the end of your previous match, quite often you will run into many of the same players. Crystalline Conflict is first-hand a battle of information. Take a look at the lineups on screen. This was across four matches. The character showcase at the start of every round played a large factor into each victory. Remembering these players across multiple sessions influences my target priority. For example, this ninja on my team in game 1 is a crystal player. From this, I knew I could make aggressive plays, knowing that this player will most likely capitalize on openings I create. However, once it came to the fourth game, I was against this very same player. Having first-hand seen him in action, I knew he would be my main target. Keeping the pressure up would make it difficult for any good player. In doing so, I take the pressure away from less experienced players on my team. Another example is the red mage from the first match who was also in the fourth. In the first game I learned they like to play aggressive, but they tend to fire off their silence almost on cooldown. Knowing this when it came to the fourth match, to help deal with this, I would make sure to keep my health high and hold on to my purify when I could. This way the silence would be less effective overall, granting me the advantage. The opening battle possibly the most crucial stage of any Crystalline Conflict round. Before the change to how fast the objective would unlock, the opening battle was not worth it. Both teams would sit and wait for the objective before making a move. This was because if you went straight in, regardless of winning or losing that opening battle, the objective would still be locked. Therefore, the team that just lost the battle could return to the objective or just as they would begin moving it. Such a small amount of reward was not worth the effort. However, now the unlock time is 20 seconds. This countdown begins from the very moment those gates unlock. Typically, you would use around 10 seconds traveling towards the objective, leaving you 10 more seconds to win the fight. Aggressive teams can pull this off more often than you would think gaining both early limit break charge and control of the objective. Now you are probably wondering why this is so important. Especially in the ranks from bronze up to plat, the opening battle can very easily set the tone for the entire match. It is not uncommon for the team that wins the opening fight to then completely steamroll the other team. Why does this happen? Firstly, after the initial fight, you are free to reset with elixirs. The team can also divide between the objective and potential spawn camping. More often than not, the biggest mistake that occurs from the team that lost the opening fight is that they begin to stagger. They panic, seeing the objective moving, and think, oh no, I must delay this. Not understanding that yes, they will stall for a few seconds, but they will put their team in a much worse scenario, meaning second fight, they will be one team member down, while also feeding into their limit gauges. Once the team that is steamrolling begin coming into their limit breaks, it is pretty much game over. So remember, do not be afraid to take the opening battle. Be aggressive. If you feel the need to retreat, do so and heal up. The opening battle can be fast or it can be drawn out. Play smart and to your strengths. If you are, however, the team that lost the opening battle, resist all urge to mindlessly charge back in. Yes, they shall be moving the objective. That's okay. Give them space. Look for where your team is and for respawns. Winning that following battle can just as easily turn the tide, setting your team up for their own steamroll. You will unfortunately be met by players who will just run in on repeat. This can rarely be helped. Sometimes you may be able to crowd control the enemy off them or burst the target with enough damage to scare them away. Ultimately, you need to make the best of the situation, treating the round more as a 5v4, with your goal being a fast pick to even out the playing field. The Limit Break, the most powerful ability for each class. It is important to understand what your Limit Break does, including the charge time. Faster Limit Breaks such as the Reaper I am currently playing charge extremely fast, whereas jobs such as the Samurai have a much longer charge time. You can expect to start seeing the first Limit Breaks following the opening battle. The biggest mistakes I see is players holding their Limit Gauge for far too long. 
Now if there was a samurai in any of these rounds, 100% I would be tracking his limit gauge throughout the entire match, as the reaper's limit break is wonderful for shutting down a samurais who typically get 1-2 to two a match. With no samurai present, I am free to use my limit break aggressively, keeping the fight momentum going. If the team is dead, it comes down to you as the player to decide what your goal is. Do you wait for the regroup, or do you go for the stall? Correct limit break usage can immediately give your team a strong advantage. A monk's combo with their ultimate is amazing against any ranged class. As a machinist, you can combine your drill with your sniper to instantly drop a player. Dragoons can devastate entire teams and combines extremely well with other limit breaks and even map environmentals. The Dancer and the Reaper are god-tier jobs for forcing people into environmentals. The fastest games are controlled by limit breaks. Both teams have the same access to seeing each other's party throughout the entire match allowing you to keep track of the limit break of those on your team and which enemies have theirs. For example, if a samurai has theirs, you need to be looking for the activation of Chiten and then stop all damage. That way, you can avoid the insta-kill. Should a warrior have theirs, you want to ready your burst and not use your guard, as they will shut yours down. Against a ninja, you need to keep yourself above 50% health to avoid that one-hit kill. The list goes on. Good limit break usage will get you into the gold ranks in no time. Within the higher ranks, from platinum onwards, keeping track of the enemy's limit gauge becomes more and more essential, as in higher tiers, more and more players will be keeping an eye on your limit gauge to shut you down. The most frustrating part of Crystalline Conflict is the objective. We have all been there far too many times. Those matches where multiple, if not your entire team, ignore the objective, instead are intent of padding their stats with kills and damage, leaving us standing there going, yeah, that's great buddy. Meanwhile you are left alone, trying to fight 3-4 to four players under the crystal, desperately trying to hold that final 5 meters. Moral of the story? If you want to climb, you cannot ignore the objective. The opening battle, you're playing for control of the objective. After a team wipe, get on to the objective, unless a few of you are going to spawn camp. The more you push the objective in the early game, the easier you have it in the late game. No matter what you are doing, whether you are resetting, healing, in combat, or going for a flank, you need to get into the habit of checking the progress gauge at the top of your screen. No matter how good a player you are, the objective will always be the requirement for victory. Once the objective reaches the halfway checkpoint, players must remain inside until the progress reaches 100%. Not everyone needs to be within the objective, but you do need to be around to help those who are. One of my funniest experiences, during a round on Palestria, four diamond-ranked players got so fixated on me that they chased me for a good two minutes through the speed lanes, down through the center of the map while I grabbed the health packs along the way, all the way back to my own spawn. Meanwhile across the way, one poor white mage was in the fight of his life, doing his best in an attempt to storm my team from victory. My point being, a player's rank does not matter. At every rank, there are those who either tunnel vision or straight up ignore the objective. If you learn to keep track of the objective's whereabouts and help to move or defend when needed, you will be on a fast track to climbing rank. There are four maps within Crystalline Conflict to date. Palestria, Volcanic Heart, Cloud Nine, and the Clockwork Castle Town. Palestria is your neutral map, as there will be no environmentals to worry about. You will, however, have access to speed lanes either side. Range classes and melee rolls good for flanking should be using these routes when possible. As this map favors long-ranged more, the speed lanes help tanks and melees close the gap, catching unsuspecting players by surprise. Next, the Volcanic Heart. To date, this is still my favorite dancer map, as your honing dance is so good at trapping players within a vortex of damage in their small lanes. This map also has the best speed lane to quickly shoot through the center. Within seconds, you can get behind the enemy's backline and reap havoc. The environmental can easily be abused on this map, as a dancer, reaper, or warrior, as your limit break will shut down guards and remove a player's control. Millies have a great advantage on this map, as you can easily outline of sight range classes while also closing the gap. Cloud 9 single-handedly the best map for the Dragoon. Cloud9 is on equal terms for both ranged and close range, as the center of the map is wide open, but becomes much more close quarters around the first checkpoint. And again, the environmental can be easily abused, as there is a 5 second countdown warning you before it happens. Dragoons can limit break, then wait for the enemies to come back down. Dancers and Reapers can remove a player's control, and any hard-hitting limit break follows up nicely to any player caught within the environmental. And last up, the latest addition, 
the Clockwork Castletown. This map has inspiration from the previous maps. Large scale, with plenty of twists and turns, allows for all roles to shine. The map center has trick floors, which will launch players into the air for high damage. There are also trick doors, which can teleport players to a location they did not intend. There is also a parade, with a clockwork Omyoji or a Yojimbo. The Yojimbo will obliterate its surroundings, while the Omyoji will shrink a player who fails to look away. Increasing damage taken, lowering damage dealt, and slower movement speed. And not only that, while the parade is up, anyone who grabs a pile of gold will get a boost to their limit gauge. Overall, the best map for using environmentals to your own advantage. With so much information available, and many ways in which you can utilize your limit breaks and the maps to your advantage, climbing into platinum ranks becomes a breeze. With mastery and experience, you will continue to climb further still. Up next is round 4 on the Clockwork Castle Town. Thanks for clicking on today's video, and I shall see you all in the next one. Goodbye.